The language of the Friday khutbah has become a controversial topic. On the one hand, we have many khatibs reciting khutbahs that were prepared by other imams from up to many decades ago. The congregation often doesn't understand it, and more often than not, the khatib himself doesn't understand what he's delivering to the people, and the content of the khutbah might even be outdated or irrelevant to the congregation today. On the other hand, many khatibs also argue that the Friday khutbah should be delivered in the local language as a primary purpose of the khutbah is to remind the people and that can only happen if they understand the content that is being said to them. However, could there be a middle ground? That is, khatibs prepare their own meaningful khutbahs that are relevant to their congregations, but deliver them in Arabic and facilitate for their congregations ways to learn Arabic. Let's have a look at how that might be done. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, this is Shaheen Nur Rahman and on this channel we discuss Islamic and educational content. In this video we're going to talk about how to prepare an Arabic khutbah from scratch. These techniques can apply equally to Jumu'ah and Eid and for the purposes of this video the topic of the khutbah under discussion will be welcoming Ramadan. Now preparing a khutbah in Arabic is not too different from preparing something in English or in any other language. The difference being that Jumu'ah comes with certain criteria that must be fulfilled. So what constitutes a khutbah? Now the Hanifi school has very few criteria, so that doesn't give us too much to go off. What I personally recommend Imams and Khatibs to do is to prepare the khutbahs in a way that is congruent with all four schools. The way to do that is to take the criteria or the arkan from the strictest school and to use that as a template to build your khutbah. For instance, in the Shafi'i school, there are five criteria to a valid khutbah. Three of them have to occur in both khutbahs and two of them have to occur in one of them. So the first three are Alhamdulillah, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa salatu ala rasulillah, sending blessings and salutations to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the third one, al wasiyatu bi taqwa to remind the audience that they should be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to obey Allah and his messenger. These three arkan need to be in both khutbahs, the first and the second khutbah. Now, al wasiyah bi taqwa can be done in a few different ways. You can say, for example, usikum bi taqwa Allah, or you can say something a bit more generic like aqi'u Allah wa rasulah. Either of the two will fulfill this criteria. Number four is qira'atu ayati min al-Qur'an, to recite a complete ayah from the Qur'an. And this ayah needs to be complete and meaningful so we can't say something like mudham matan and leave it there that's not going to be that's not a complete sentence this needs to be in only one of them however if you have multiple verses and in more than one khutbah that's completely fine as well and the final criterion in the shafi'i school for the validity of the khutbah is a dua ulil mu'minina wal mu'minat this has to be done in the second khutbah now while dua can be quite broad and you can make dua for somebody to have lots of children and have a house and be wealthy in life what is intended here is the dua must be ukhrawi it has to be something to do with the akhirah for example, something like Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat can fulfill the criterion of this khutbah. This doesn't mean you can't make other types of du'as, you can of course do that. However, this something of this nature must be there, even if it is something that is specific to the congregation at hand. For example, rahimakumullah will technically fulfill it, although it's better to be a bit wider. Now, these five criteria give us a bit of a template. For instance, you can start off with alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, or you can lengthen those out. Those of you into poetry and rhymes, you can get a bit creative here. And if you want, you can rhyme the hamd and the salah together and you can have a nice little par paragraph at the top. What's helpful here is to use dictionaries like Al-Qamus Al-Muhiyyut, which is organized not in the traditional way of the, the first letter of the word. It is actually in the order of the last letter of every word. So that's quite useful for finding rhyming words. There's also an interesting blog called Qawafi, where you can just click on a letter and it give you a, suggestions of many words that end with that letter. Now after the formalities of the Hamdan Salah, you can do Al-Wasayyat bi Taqwa either immediately or later on. My personal practice is to put it in immediately and use that as a segue to transition from the Hamdan Salah into my topic. So for instance, on this occasion I said Amma ba'd fayya ayyuhal mu'minun ittaqullaha wa shkuruha. So ittaqullah is already there. So ittaqullah usikum bi taqwallah all of these are valid ways to fulfill this orokin. Now after that you have the space to say whatever you want to say. So for instance, if you've gathered multiple ayat that are relevant to the topic, or you can look into the books of hadith and gather a number of riwayat that are relevant to the, the discussion. If you want any supplementary notes like a, an anecdote or a story or a couplet or something like that, that's completely fine as well. What I personally like to do is reference everything on quote. So for instance, if I've got the ayah, I'll put the reference in it immediately just like you find in a, in a traditional printed arabic book or in a modern 
um, Arabic book. Now, if it's hadith, then sometimes you can put that in the footnote, sometimes you can put it immediately within the main body of the text. I tend to do a bit of both, but I, I wouldn't necessarily read out um, the numbers or something. For example, here I've got Waqad Akhraj al Bukhari and I've got the number 1899 and Muslim 1079. But I wouldn't read those numbers out. I'll say, وَقَدْ أَخْرَجَ الْبُخَارِيُّ وَمُسْلِمٌ عَنْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ And say the hadith. Now, it's important to have a running thread that goes through your khutbah to ensure that everything is on topic and it doesn't go from one topic to another. In the words of YouTubers and content creators, you have to tell a story. To have a clear beginning, middle and an end and to have a clear message that you're trying to give. If the khutbah is to remind her, then are you reminding? What is it that you're reminding them about? What is the message that you want your audience to go away with? So you can add your Quran, add some hadiths, add some you know quotes from scholars. And what I tend to do is have a clear message towards the end of the first khutbah. I'll make it very clear what I want to say. And then I'll end traditionally with So that's the end of the first khutbah. Now in the second khutbah, you do exactly the same thing with the addition of the dua for the believing men and the believing women. Some people like to frame this as though it's part two of your first khutbah and others like to keep it a bit more generic or something like that. Whatever works for your situation and you don't need to keep the same style all the time as well. One week you could do some, one week you could do a part two, another week you can do something generic. It's completely open. So long as you fulfill the arkan of the khutbah according to all four schools, so you can have your hamdan salah at the beginning, you have your usikum wa nafsi awadam bitaqwa Allah and you want to say what you want to say, have your quotes, have your ayat, have your hadiths if you want to. Of course you only need the ayah in one khutbah, but if you want to do it in two khutbahs it's completely fine. If you want to increase uh, the content by putting in hadiths and other things, completely fine to do that. As usual I reference everything as well and here this is the opportunity to make dua. So you can start off with something like Allahumma khfik lil mu'minina wal mu'minat and try to make it a bit more specific to your congregation or to the people of your time. If there's an earthquake or a natural disaster or an act of God that's happening at the time, there's a crisis around the world, you make dua for the people and you don't forget them. And this is the time to make the dua at the end of the second khutbah. Now in terms of the length of the khutbahs, I try to keep mine a bit balanced in that it's not so short that it becomes a ritual and it's not so long that it becomes cumbersome, which is inappropriate for Jumu'ah. So all in all, when I stand up on the mimbar and I deliver both of my khutbahs, it takes roughly six minutes. Of course, this can change depending on your urf and the custom of your people. So this is my way of preparing an Arabic khutbah. If you want to see how I take notes when reading, click here.